let's record this. So uh, two weeks ago, we had a refresher on networking um, and we talked a little bit of networking and we talked about um, client server networking with the backend providing some data and the mobile apps being the, the clients. But that's not the only way you can utilize mobile devices. So for example, if you are in a classroom and all of you have mobile devices, you can kind of talk with each other or chat or exchange photos without necessarily going to the managed infrastructure or, or to the internet as such. Um, so mobile devices offer the possibility of communicating with each other in kind of more ad hoc um, fashion. And there are different models of how this can be achieved. So Internet of Things is all about sensors and kind of uh, decentralized uh, sensing and actuators doing stuff like, you know, automating your home. Um, you can control certain things with smart switches and, and things like this. And they all form kind of a mesh network where devices kind of talk with each other and uh, negotiate certain things. And with mobile devices, it's kind of the same. So if you have two mobile phones, I have, um, you know, um, multiple mobile phones at home. Like I, I have my kids and my wife also using mobile phones. And we can kind of set up an ad hoc network and, and do certain things like chatting. Uh, without necessarily using the infrastructure. Um, so this is what we will talk today about. We will talk about um, networking and done in such a way that it doesn't require the infrastructure. Um, so first, you know, let's do a little bit of a refresher. So we have the networking stack, which we need to deal with. And we have those seven OSI layers, which um, we kind of covered in the cloud com, uh, programming course, and you covered it in the networking course, uh, and they form kind of a fundamental concepts that, that we need to understand. So those, those layers kind of go from one to seven. Uh, on the lowest layer, we have the physical kind of, um, you know, some physical uh, material that communicates between two ends. So it can be a fiber optic, it can be a copper cable, it can be a radio waves. It has, it has some physicality to it, right? It's not yet kind of a data. It's basically some physical uh, material that actually is used to propagate signals. Then on layer two, we have data link. So here we are already talking about some form of digital um, signal that the data link layer understands. And the most famous one that everybody's using is Ethernet and Ethernet 2. And the MAC kind of address is the, and the Ethernet frame are the kind of two concepts that we use. So we basically have network cards which are identifiable by a unique MAC address. So each network card in the world has a unique Ethernet or MAC address. And then the cards can exchange a frame between each other up to 1.5 um, uh, megabytes, or you can use kind of a giant frames if you want to go over a certain um, threshold to, to pass data between, right? So the normal ethernet frame is limited to 1.5 megabytes, um, but uh, no, no, actually uh, 1500, 1500 bytes. And then, um, you can go with uh, larger numbers if both ends kind of agree to send larger frames. And then we wrap it up into something that can communicate across um, local area networks. So Ethernet is fine as long as you have local area network and the switch or the, um, the device which routes the traffic between Ethernet frames knows the addresses of the MAC, uh, the, the MAC addresses of the network cards which are connected to it because it can pass appropriate frames to appropriate addresses. But as long as we go to um, LANs which are in multiple locations and com uh, connected to multiple switches, then you need something else. You need some universal addressing scheme that can pass the, the packets in that case uh, between the different routers. And that, that's why we have the internet protocol for IPv4 and IPv6. Um, so we covered that before. It's kind of just a quick kind of refresher. Um, but just having the 
connectivity layer is not enough if you want some sort of reliable connections. And that's why we have TCP and UDP on layer four, providing us kind of a either connection oriented or co connection less oriented uh, transmissions. Um, and then we have kind of higher levels for organizing the application layer stack such that we can deal with encoding of um, multimedia informations or with managing cookies and sessions if we're talking about HTTP, for example. So this is all well known and kind of, you know, you already know that. So in the concept of ad hoc networking, where do we fit? Like at which layer or in between which layer would we like to have some facilities which will allow us to communicate? Well, that is kind of a very interesting questions, question. So when I was preparing the, the lecture, um, it turned out that um, one of the, one of the um, libraries which Android offers is called Nearby API. And Nearby API allows you to communicate between two uh, mobile phones, between two Android mobile phones using ultrasound audio waves, right? So you can be in a room which has a Wi-Fi or you know, um, magnet, magnetic field kind of jammer, which obstructs using the uh, radio waves or radio protocols, but your two phones will still be able to exchange data because they are not using radio waves, they're using audio waves. Um, in which case, this, is, this will be kind of a, a clever way of doing physical layer, not using radio transmitters, but using microphone and speaker to communicate data between two phones, right? Um, so we can go all the way down to the physical layer to offer some form of ad hoc networking, or we can rely on existing infrastructure and existing uh, protocol stack and build something on top of HTTP, right? So it, it is kind of up to us where we want to fit the ad hoc networking or kind of a communication between two mobile devices at which layer. And it kind of depends what your goals are and what your objectives are for this communication. So this is kind of um, an, an interesting dilemma and also some interesting opportunities. Um, all right, so let's move on. So we basically need some sort of infrastructure. Uh, as I said, it can be on any of the layers. Uh, it, we can go all the way down to layer one and build something using you know, uh, ultrasound audio, or we can go all the way up and build something on top of existing protocols in layer seven, uh, such as HTTP. But what we will need is, we will need some sort of services or modules or layers that allow us to communicate with. Um, so then when we have that, in between these modules or layers, we have either an API or a protocol, right? So for example, if we were to build something on top of HTTP, we would probably build some sort of REST API, which will have certain way uh, of initiating a, a message or initiating the transmission, and then certain parameters which are passed through this REST uh, API, right? So we would define some sort of module with some sort of appropriate API to communicate with it. But if we were to build something on top of um, audio, uh, we would need kind of a protocol of how the modulation works and how we can demodulate and modulate the signal such that we can obtain the data from it, right? So we have this kind of a choice of first, where we place it, and second, how we will kind of play with it, either through API or through protocol. So now, you know, comes a question, what is, what, what's, what's the difference? What's the big difference between an API and a protocol? Um, and it is, you know, it is a, a little bit tricky question uh, because, the, you know, fundamentally, there is not much of a difference. They basically both work as a glue which connects two modules or layers. They kind of sit in between, right? Um, so this is what we said here. It's like, you know, you have some sort of services or modules or protocol layers uh, like we had here. 
and there is stuff sitting in between. Uh, and what is in between? What you know? What makes um, IPv4 kind of you know so something on top of um, IPv on on TCP being able to use the IPv4? Well, we, we kind of call them protocols, and we call them kind of this um, onion-like encapsulations of headers. Uh, a mechanism of how they can be used and how can be how can we go from one layer to the other, um, but you could also do that like how we do that on the application seven by providing a restful API, right? If someone builds an app and opens up a restful API, we don't say it's a protocol; we say it's an API. Uh, but it basically offers the same kind of functionality; it offers us a way to access stuff on that layer. Um, so it, it, it is a little bit of semantic similarity. Uh, the difference are kind of in syntax and also in the focus, right? So usually when we uh, start with services, modules, or libraries, um, we say that they expose an API to access them, right? So we start with kind of a functioning unit, which then to be able to be used needs to expose something to itself. And that is, you know, an API. However, if we first start with the way how something works and then keep those implementations kind of in, you know, independent or keep, keep those implementation agnostic, then we talk about the protocol, right? So, you know, of course, API is implementation agnostic as well. So for example, if I have a REST API, it doesn't matter how it is implemented, whether it's implemented in Rust or whether it's implemented in Golang or in Java, you know, the API is kind of implementation agnostic as well. Um, so same with protocol, but we usually uh, start with defining kind of the, um, the workings and then expose the API rather than defining the API and then implementing it. But of course we could do it the other way around as well. Um, so, you know, the, the difference is there, but it's kind of not really a, a huge semantic difference. It's more the way they are structured and the, the way they are, they are um, specified and the way they are implemented. Um, some APIs are defined first. So in a lot of standards, we define the API first and then have a reference implementation which conform, conforms to this API. But it's much, much more often to define the protocol first and then have a reference implementation following a particular protocol rather than the API. So, you know, we use both. We use both kind of quite precisely. They fill the same niche but, and they differ, but they kind of, um, the differences are yeah, somewhat settled. Um, all right. so. In any case, we need some sort of um, infrastructure and we will need a way to access it. Um, and there are existing APIs and existing protocols which offer us to deal with the ad hoc networking. So one is sockets, right? Uh, what is a socket? Um, well, sockets is, you know, a POSIX uh, standard for end-to-end -end communication. Um, it's a very simple abstraction over an end-to-end -end communication. Um, one node acts as a server, the other nodes act as clients, and then you can talk between the client and the server. And they are identified by a port and an address um, because we operate on layer four. So we are kind of, you know, sockets are defined on this layer four. So we have ports which come from layer four and addresses, which come from layer three. Um, and then we can kind of make them um, talk with each other. Uh, and there is a set of well-known ports, which we use every day for SSH or for a mail and, and so on and so forth, right? So if I go um, and open a terminal, for example, so I will, make it bigger and I will use a different shell and I open another terminal and I, for example, try to talk to NTNU um, mail gateway 
So if I tell net, yeah. So if I tell net to our um, GitLab server on port twenty five, it will hang and do nothing because we are actually not running a mail server on the uh, on our GitLab server. But if I do the same with the mail gateway, um, mail gateway of NTNU, it will happily connect to me, right? And what I basically have, I have a standard input forwarding my uh, commands to the, um, to the mail gateway. And whatever the gateway sends to me, I can see on the screen here. Um, so one of the, uh, we would need to, uh, check um, SMTP, SMTP uh, example. So we can check what are the commands which um, SMTP is using. So here is the single si simple uh, exchange between the client and the server. So the server, when you connect to it, should reply with uh, something like this, and we can see that it does, right? It says uh, code 220, which means everything is okay, and it says its address, what version of the SMTP protocol it's running, is it its postfix, and then what operating system they have. And then I have to, uh, you know, declare myself, uh, so I have to say who I am. So if I say, hello, I am... Um, localhost, it says, okay, um, I, <laughs> it, it says the first part, so it recognized that I am localhost, and then I can kind of start preparing a mail and sending a mail uh, using the interaction with the server, and that's what your mail, mail client does, right? So your uh, mail client uh, talks to the mail server over the sockets the same way I'm kind of trying out here. Um, one, yes, so to close it, I need this one. So one of the um, uh, easy way for testing um, your backend is to co uh, connect to it and then issue commands uh, by, you know, by standard socket uh, clients. And one of those clients is Telnet. So Telnet is kind of a vanilla, uh, communicator over sockets, and another one is Netcat. So uh, Netcat on Mac is called NC, uh, and I can uh, basically connect to a local host on port 8888 uh, using Netcat, right? So if I try to do this, it returns because um, I'm not running anything on 8888, so it basically quits. If I try to do the same with Telnet, um, it quits as well because it says uh, connection refused. So there is nothing running on 8888. But I can use Netcat to um, actually run a server site on port 8888 as well. So if I do that, then in this terminal, I have a server site running. And here I can do the same with the client. And then whatever I say, hello from client, I can see on the, on the server and vice versa, right? So if the server responds something, response, I can see it on the client. Um, it's kind of um, the same if I use NCAT uh, with NCAT on the other end, right? Um, so I can test sockets and I can test my socket communication using standard command line tools, which are available in all operating systems. So, um, if we go back to slides, um, I'm kind of listing here that uh, you can connect to well-known ports yourself, or you can kind of test your own server implementation uh, with, you know, Telnet or with uh, Netcat. How would you implement the uh, sockets? Well, you know, you have an API in Kotlin, which allows you to open a client socket or the server socket. What's the difference? What's the difference between client socket and server socket? Well, um, as you've seen here, if I want to open um, a port, 
I can open a port 8888, right? Um, and then uh, people can connect to me. So if I open, let's open two terminals again. So I now have two clients and I have one server. So if I open the server and I say uh, netcat local host 8888, I'm connected, right? So I have a client connected to port 8888, right? If the server had only one socket waiting for connections on port 8888, then what should happen if I try to connect uh, a second net, netcat um, to localhost 8888? Well, this socket would be occupied talking to this terminal already, right? And I should not be able to talk to port 8888, right? Uh, again. So let's try it. And hello from client two. Um, and hello from client one. So the message from client one gets kind of printed here. The message from client two isn't. Um, that is probably a feature or a bug of the netcat because this doesn't say connection refused. It kind of allowed me to connect, right? So hello from server. Um, so these two are talking, but this one seemed to not be connected. In reality, what happens is um, the server starts a socket on port 8888 and waits for connections. Um, when a, co a, a connection happen, the server starts a new socket responds to the other end that there is a new socket which this guy will be talking to and this port is free for a new connection to occur right um, so if i close this one uh, it kind of kills the server and kills this connection as well so it, it is kind of implementation specific but in in um in in general if why yeah let me try Maybe there is a flag that I... So L... So PS... PPP... It should be a way for the um, server to listen on multiple connections at the same time. Um, I, when I did those tests on Linux before, it actually worked such a way that uh, multiple um, uh, clients could talk to the same server. I, I can figure it out later on. The idea is that um, once the server starts, First, it listens on a particular port, and then upon re request to this port, it spawns a new socket, uh, responds to the caller with this new socket, and passes the communication to this new socket instead, and keeps the, the 8888 open such that new connections can come and connect to the same, you know, start initiate the, the, the connections through the server. Otherwise, if you only had one, it would be kind of blocked, and then you can't really have multiple clients connecting to it. So that's what differentiates the server socket from the client socket, because the client socket will kind of start the local end of the socket and connect to the remote end. And this end will always be the same. It's, it's like fixed. Whereas the server socket has the ability to kind of uh, spawn a new sockets such that the original one is kept free for new connections to start and to get initiated. So this is kind of the idea between the client and the server socket. Um, and then it's pretty straightforward. You basically follow the API, uh, you initiate the connection, you have to specify what I, uh, address and port you want to initiate the connection if you are here, and what port and uh, uh, um, local interface you want to be bound when you 
waiting for connections. And then here, when connection comes, you usually start a new thread. You pass the new uh, socket to this kind of new thread and manage the actual communication while the, um, the server socket recalls connect and opens up the connections for new uh, newcomers, right? So when the connection comes, then the thread starts and then you, rec you call again uh, kind of the, um, the, the waiting for new connections. You might have the case where you're only waiting for a single connection, in which case you can occupy the, the, the socket that you got and you may not re re reopen the server socket again but it will nevertheless start a new socket for your, uh, for your end of the connection. Um, all right, so, you know, sockets. And then you have the IO pipe, which will pass the bytes like an IO stream between the, the two ends. Um, so uh, what else, what other facilities we have in Android um, to, help us to do this mobile to mobile connection without the infrastructure. Uh, there are three uh, APIs. Um, and the first one is called network service discovery. I will talk a little bit about it in a moment. Um, the second one is Wi-Fi direct with the peer to peer mode. And the third one is nearby API, which uh, Christopher reminded me of. Uh, and uh, we had a, a, a group um, in this course last year or two years ago, which actually did the project using the nearby API to get a simple communication between the mobile devices going. So I will start with the last one first, and then we will talk about these two a little bit more. Um, so the nearby API is quite nice because it's a high level library. So the, the benefits of it is that it's a high level library um, and it is agnostic to the underlying uh, networking stack. So Bluetooth, near field communication, Wi-Fi, all can be used for making the, com the communication going and you kind of don't need to know what actually is used beneath. Uh, you, you get kind of a high level uh, exposure on the, on the API level, uh, which allows you to do that. So, when I was reading the documentation, I discovered that it actually also uses uh, ultrasonic audio, right? Which is so cool. I, I really would like to test it. So you basically turn off all your networking that you have on two phones, and you basically can send messages with the networking in the uh, you know flight mode. Um, so in the airplane where you are, you know, forced to change the um, uh, the settings to um, flight mode, you should technically be still able to chat with your friends which are on board with you are using this one. Uh, hopefully nobody can hear them because they are ultrasonic, which means uh, they are in a spectrum which is kind of um, not detectable by humans, uh, but you know, it, it is kind of cool. So if we go here to the documentation, you can check what, what exactly happens and when it's uh, useful to use this facility. So um, this facility is offered for messaging, right? So you can basically uh, send some form of binary payload uh, between devices and it works in a subscribe publish model. Um, so you first uh, issue a kind of a subscription key, which is unique for your payload and then other devices which are interested in this particular subscription key can register an interest. Um, so then, you know, a publishing app ma makes a request to associate uh, a payload to this, um, to this token, to this subscription key. Um, and then uh, this association happens. And then the, the device which wants to transmit the message uses one of the un underlying technologies um, to and announce that it has this message to be delivered. And then a subscribing application can say, oh yeah, I'm interested in this particular token. And then when the other side detects the, the, the broadcasted token, um, the server facilitates the delivery of the message. Um, how it works exactly, I don't know because I haven't tested it. Um, and I'm not sure if this, for example, this uh, ultrasonic modem kind of works um, 
without any connectivity whatsoever, because there is that point five, which says that the message exchange is guaranteed to come from the same app, right? So the underlying mechanism, the underlying library makes sure that whoever is announcing the message is the same developer and the same app of who is listening it. So it has kind of a built-in, um, some sort of built-in security protocol, which doesn't allow snooping on people using this API uh, from outside the developer's uh, control. So you as a developer, you will kind of have the, uh, the messaging done within your app, but not across different developers' apps, right? So it is a feature and also a, a drawback sometimes. Like if you want to, for example, develop an uh, open protocol messaging app, which other implementations can plug into, uh, then this might not be the best because this prevents third party developers to be listening to your messages from your device, uh, from, from your app. Uh, but like uh, if you only want your app to, to exchange messages with your app only, and you want to be in full control, then that, that is the mechanism which enforces it. So it has some advantages and it has some disadvantages. Uh, it has some features basically, and it is useful in certain circumstances and it may not be the solution for you in other circumstances. And it is Android specific. So out of those three different models, this one is kind of the most Android specific one. And this one is the most standard based one. Okay, so it is uh, three past three. So let's have um, a, a 10 minutes break and we'll come back and we'll talk about those standards first. And then I will talk a little bit about NSD and, uh, and Wi-Fi Direct. So let's meet uh, back like uh, 13 minutes past three. Any questions so far? No questions. Okay, so let's meet in uh, ten minutes, and I will pause the pause the recording. Recording. <laughs> yeah, this API is quite easy actually. Um, so if you follow the the tutorial, they kind of have uh, some code examples, and they uh, show you kind of step by step what you know, what you need to register and how it, how it works and how you do this publish subscribe um, uh, API. So it's one of the simplest APIs. Out of the three, this one will be the easiest and the simplest. It doesn't allow any form of streaming though. It's only kind of a discrete messaging. Uh, but if messaging is all what you want, it's, you know, that, that's great. Uh, so you can kind of, um, you can check, check it out. Um, so then the second one, um, the second one is network service discovery. But before we talk about this one, um, we stress that <clears throat> NSD is using um, kind of a cross platform technologies. And they all have to do with something which is typically called zero configuration networking. So this is, kind of a family of technologies which are used for um, service discovery and for communication without setting up the, the network, setting up the infrastructure. Um, so the idea is that you have no configuration, no name service running, and you have no pre-configured uh, infrastructure, but you can get some things done. Uh, and it uses a multicast DNS, uh, and DNS service discovery. Um, and the NSD from Google is kind of an equivalent to the Bonjour from Apple. So they, are, they both use basically those um, uh, standard RFC standards. Um, they just wrap it up in slightly different APIs and slightly different uh, naming conventions, but the discoveries are basically the same. So if you're using NSD on your Android phone, and you advertise the service, then an Apple phone will be able to discover it and talk to it. Uh, so they are kind of a cross-system um, cross co uh, compatible. 
Um, I did a little bit of a check and um, I discovered that if you go to Bonjour uh, from Apple, uh, they actually don't support anything apart from Windows and Mac and iOS, obviously. So you can have the Bonjour SDK for Windows and then you can have the kind of uh, service discoveries done um, with uh, between Mac and iOS and Windows uh, devices. They have kind of a code. Um, so in theory, it should also run on Linux, possibly, but uh, I've, uh, it seems people who are running Linux, they use this um, Avahi implementation. So Avahi is another implementation of uh, MDNS, uh, which is uh, distributed with source code, and that one definitely works on Linux. And this one might be more cross-platform than the Bonjour one from, uh, from Apple. Uh, but of course, if you're using Android, you're gonna use uh, the NSD API from Android. Um, all right, so what is NSD? Well, it is um, a very simple handshake protocol for discovering um, services on the local network. So it is used for like local webcams or HTTP servers or, you know, uh, printers and so on. And you can also use it for discovering other mobile devices if you have an app which offers some sort of service. Um, so you might be able to, for example, drop images from phone to phone or use it for chat or do a file transfer or w whatever your application is. Um, you, the, the premise is that you kind of expose a service to your local area network, and then you can broadcast an interest in discovering services which are nearby, and then you get kind of the list of services which are nearby, and you can connect to them. So there is a little bit of a metadata, metadata information related to the services which are nearby, like, you know, a printer will advertise itself as a printing service, and then you can connect to it and send the jobs. Um, if you have an app, which is a messaging app, you, you, it can advertise itself as a messaging app, right? Um, there is a standard list of, uh, so if you follow the, uh, the tutorial on the, uh, on the Google developers uh, page, um, they basically uh, guide you step by step um, how the services are kind of advertised and you will notice that they are kind of advertised by the name and by a port on which that name works. So it, it is kind of designed to be mostly used by well-known services such as printing service or mail service or whatever that is that have standard TCP ports which are associated with that service. Um, of course, if you're making an app for like chat, uh, you don't need to register this port as a well-known port unless you want to be kind of a, uh, a standard, one of the standard chat protocols, but you could reuse um, uh, some, you can re-implement like locally some, lo uh, some well-known uh, messaging API or messaging uh, standard, or you can define your own. Usually when you do this, you should register your port as a kind of a, a well-known port. So here they say um, the International Assignment Numbers Authority manages centralized list of well-known services. Uh, so then, you know, those services are kind of uh, recognized by NSD and Bonjour uh, uh, implementations. So then if you want to be kind of well-known, you should go through the process of, of registering and like locking the particular port. But, you know, you can use an arbitrary point, port and also you don't have to have a well-known port. What you can do is you can, instead of hard coding a port, you can say, okay, um, just start the service on some random port, on arbitrary point, port and advertise it and then whoever discovers you will get the port with uh, together with the discovery so then they know which port to connect to because it's part of the advertisement um, so that's kind of the, the other mechanism and then again it's a quite simple short tutorial of how you're registering a service 
how you're listening for connections and how you're replying to the peers which do try to connect to you and also how you do that the, the service discovery so how you kind of initiate the discovery and how you get the uh, the list of services nearby you can specify what service you want or you can say a generic broadcast saying okay i am i'm interested in any services which are nearby tell me all of them so if you follow the uh, this tutorial then you get this um uh, the NSD part working. Um, so th this one is quite straightforward also. It, it differs from the nearby API because this one uses a very standard internet protocol uh, mechanisms, uh, which are well defined and they are kind of a cross platform and interoperable. Uh, it requires that layer four to be available because it, it, it is working on top of layer four, right? So we need to have an IP address and we need to be able to open a port. Um, if we don't have an IP address yet, then you know that's not a mechanism you can easily use, right? So for example, if I have two mobile phones and they are connected to an access point, they have been given an IP address, even if it's a local area network IP address, that's great. So this mechanism kind of opens up the connectivity possibilities and we can play some peer-to-peer -peer mobile game or something between ourselves. But if I have two mobile phones in a, uh, you know, flight mode, or if I have two mobile phones which have Wi-Fi but I'm in the plane and there is no access point to connect to, uh, then this mechanism might not work. Uh, you may not be able to discover each other because they don't have kind of assigned IP addresses yet. There is no network kind of stack uh, going on. I haven't connected to anything. I have a network interface, but I haven't been given an IP address from anybody yet. So then I cannot connect to somebody else because I need to have an IP address and a port, right? Um, this mechanism only works in local area network, right? So even though I have an internet address, I cannot connect to a service which is sort of somewhere else. Uh, of course, I can connect to a service which is somewhere else by hard coding the IP address and port and then opening a socket to that service. That's what we did with SMTP, but it's not discoverable through those um, M uh, multicast DNS or the DNS SD, right? Um, so that would be that would need to be happening kind of outside of the normal uh, protocol here. All right, so let's move to um, a simple application using kind of a chat service, uh, and that's exactly what this uh, tutorial goes through, right? So this tutorial kind of uh, sets up a simple chat service uh, and then advertises it and then discovers the, the other device discovers it, connects to it, and then you can exchange messages. Um, so you register your, your service and then you advertise it to your local area network, you broadcast the advertisement, and then the other app can kind of search for advertiser advertisements which are happening or be listening for advertisements. So it depends who comes first to the network. Like if I have a client coming first, the client might issue the kind of a listening uh, for broadcast um, uh, initiation. So when the broadcast happens, there will be intent passed to my app that, okay, some new service appeared in the, uh, in the network. And then I will be able to do something with it. If the server comes first and advertises, nobody hear, hears that yet, so it kind of, it's gone, but then, uh, the client comes in and client issues a request for broadcasts, right? So it kind of does the service discovery and then the server is notified, oh yeah, there is a discovery going on, you can re-advertise. And then the server re-advertises, the client gets the notification and then can connect, right? Um, so once the, the client and the server connect, they can communicate through sockets. Uh, so we go back to this, you know, uh, the, the service will have a server socket waiting on this well-known port and then the clients will connect to it. All right, so um, there are some comments and some questions. Uh, so how do you structure this application? Should the service run as an Android service or should it be run in the activity? Um, 
should we have um, should we have it running in the background all the time, even if the client app is not running? Um, how should the service become a client if there are two apps? Like I have two instances of the app, right? And one was first and one kind of said, okay, I listened for, uh, for some broadcast, but there was nobody. There, clearly there was no chat service. So I became a, a service. I became the, the service provider, but there is a new app. So should the app only work as a client or should the app also advertise itself as a service? Uh, how would you deal with this? Um, and so on and so forth. So there are some, uh, some questions and some things to think um, of how would you kind of organize it such that it kind of makes sense for a simple chat application, right? So consider that. All right, so then we have the final, um, final model, which is the middle one, uh, which is called Wi-Fi Direct. Um, so this one, NSD is based on standards, is interoperable. It follows the layer four. You do need to have layer four uh, available. And then the local discovery and local management of services is, is done by this, right? Uh, we have nearby API, which is a very nice high level API, which hides all the underlying infrastructure from us. We don't need to have layer four. It can be anything like, you know, including the ultrasound audio. Um, and it is only used for message, for discrete message, like binary payload passing. And it only works in within Android ecosystem uh, because it will not be compatible with um, other implementations. There might be some implementations which re-implemented the um, some of the uh, protocol stack, uh, but I'm not aware of it and I don't think so. So it's rather Android centric, um, especially with this check that the messages are signed by the same uh, signature which the app was signed with, right? So it has to be the same developer which issued the, the message for them to be able to read each other messages. <clears throat> And then we have the middle one, and the middle one is somewhat standardized, but not super standardized. So uh, iOS and Android, they both have Wi-Fi Direct. The Wi-Fi Direct implementations differ a little bit, so it may or may not interoperate. Uh, interoperate. Uh, so some people were, were suggesting that it can interoperate between the two implementations. In some cases, it doesn't. So it depends. You would need to play with this. So, but what is common here is that you don't have layer four yet. And this Wi Fi direct mechanisms allow you to get to layer four in ad hoc fashion. So, what this layer offers is you have a bunch of devices which are nearby, which can see each other. There is no access point. So for example, again, you are in the plane, uh, but not in flight mode anymore. You are actually tuning on your Wi-Fi, but there is no access point. So there is no, nothing to connect to, but you creating the kind of infrastructure, your, your mobile phone acts, acts as an access point for other phones and they can connect to you. Uh, and your phone can give them an IP address and then you can talk over layer four because one of the devices becomes a de facto access point and is kind of managing the, uh, the network. Um, and the way it works is a little bit complex, um, <clears throat> but we have a, a concept of the group. Uh, so a group is basically a, a, a set of devices which are nearby and can see each other. Um, one of the devices becomes a group manager and the group manager manages the way the IP addresses are divided across the, the group and who is alive and who isn't alive. So the group manager manages a newcomers to get appropriate IP address, which doesn't collide with the ones which are in the group. Um, and then it is also uh, managing kind of some of the synchronization between the, the peers. Um, such that we have this kind of a single LAN like uh, network between the peer-to-peer -peer devices. Um, 
obviously one of the devices can work as a bridge, as a relay. So if one of the devices is connected to internet, then you could route the traffic to internet and back to, to your kind of little LAN that you have between the devices. That's how IoT devices usually work, where you have a base station and a bunch of sensors. The sensors cannot connect to internet, but they can connect to the base station and then the base station transmits the signals uh, to the rest of the world. Um, <clears throat> you can use it for uh, something which is called delay tolerant networking. Um, so if we, for example, imagine that you are on a desert and you don't have any uh, networking infrastructure whatsoever, but you have a bunch of troops or like, you know, a hiking trip and every of you have a mobile phone with a Wi-Fi. The Wi-Fi will have a certain range and then you can form a group um, of people who can kind of communicate with each other. But let's say it's in a, in a village, right? So you kind of on a, uh, in a location which is isolated, but you are kind of 100 people which have mobile phones and you can talk with each other. If there is a location nearby, um, but not close enough for the Wi-Fi to connect, uh, you will have two islands. So you have your, your group being able to talk with each other and you have another group being able to talk with each other, but they cannot talk between each other because the Wi-Fi is too far. Um, but if you have some form of uh, connection, like uh, maybe between Jovig and Lillehammer, people are kind of commuting by, by bus and by taxi, or there is a, you know, a vehicle traffic going back and forth, um, we could use some protocols which carry messages or carry packets from one network to the other and back. Um, of course, it takes some time. It's kind of low, long latency, but you can have this kind of communication going. And those networks are usually uh, classified as a class of networks called delay tolerant networks. Um, and they are used in areas which don't have a proper network or internet infrastructure for allowing the, uh, the people over there to have some benefits of kind of a digital infrastructure. Um, so it, it might also be useful in situations where you are traveling with a group uh, and to a location where internet connection is like uh, really expensive and only one member has like uh, internet connection. Then you can set up this kind of LAN and share the, um, the internet connectivity through this sort of like hotspot. So it kind of would work like a, a Wi-Fi hotspot, but you would be managing what type of services and what type of messaging you are kind of allowing to pass through. So the generic hotspot allows everything to kind of pass through unless you install some firewall or whatever. But this is kind of application layer differentiation of what actually goes through and how, how it works. So this concept of a relay or bridge is kind of relevant in the concept of peer-to-peer -peer network because it opens up a kind of an isolated peer-to-peer -peer network to the rest of the, the world and can make kind of a, a more global peer-to-peer uh, -peer, um, uh, situation. So <clears throat> this one has also a nice tutorial. Uh, so you can go there um, and check, check it out. It also uses a chat, like a messaging chat uh, as, a, um, as a domain. Um, and it has a couple of gotchas. So for example, one gotcha is that you need, um, you need those permissions in the manifest, uh, which, which is all fine. Uh, and also it needs fine location. So anyone knows what is the difference between these three permissions? and this permission. So what, what is special about the first one versus the other three? Exactly, so a uh, very good answer on in the chat. Um, those three are sort of accepted when the user installs the app and then they are granted for life to the app. So once the user installs the app, those three are guaranteed that the app has. 
This one that is not the case. This one can be revoked. Even if the app is installed, the user can still say, this app doesn't have location access or this app has location access, right? So when you in install, install the app and you run the app, as a developer, you don't know if this permission is granted or not. You know those permissions are granted, but you don't know about this one. You have to check, right? So one gotcha which we had uh, when uh, we were playing with this is that as long as you don't ask the user for this permission, uh, the permission is actually not granted. So the default is false. Uh, and if with this permission being false, this doesn't work. So you cannot check the Wi-Fi status if this permission is off. So the user needs to agree to this for this to actually work, even though technically you, the app has permissions for checking Wi-Fi, uh, but it actually, you know, it actually doesn't work. Um, so you need to not only include this in the manifest, but you have to also ask a user, uh, not really ask, first you have to check if the permission is granted. Uh, if the permission is granted, then you're fine. But if the permission is not granted, you have to ask the user to grant the permission. And the very first time you run your app, this permission is false, even though it says true, you know, in the manifest. Um, so by default, this permission is false until the user specifically grants the permission. Um, all right, so that was kind of a tricky. And the other tricky bit is um, that some communication happens through the um, listeners and there is a bunch of listeners which have, um, I will show you, like on success and on failure uh, callbacks, which is kind of intuitive, but some communication happens through intents. Um, and that is kind of, yeah, quite complex interaction between what happens programmatically through callbacks and what happens programmatically through intents. Um, because some things refer to the operating system state and the operating system updating, whatever the, the updating happens, and then your app gets notified by the intents instead of the callbacks. Um, so I will kind of guide you through a little bit. So first, um, yeah, they, the way they, they've ordered it is a little bit less intuitive than the way I will describe it, okay? So I will describe it. <clears throat> um, uh, yeah, it's probably the best is if I show you the, the code which will be in the repo. Um, so I, we, we have like a simple um, chat peer-to-peer -peer, uh, app which is based on this, um, on this example. Um, and we have a peer manager, which is uh, initiating the entire process. So I will start with this one. So we've implemented our own class, which references the activity. And the first thing you need to do is you need to get the handle of the manager, like a P2P manager. So we, we're doing it kind of in this line here. Uh, and then, <clears throat> you need to um, initiate, uh, uh, you, you need to make the manager, yes, let me see. Yeah, so the main activity, registers all the listeners, yep, and yeah, here. All right, so, so first you obtain the reference to the manager, and then the second thing you need to do is you need to initialize the Wi-Fi subsystem. This call will not work if you don't have this location granted. So first you need to ask the user for the location, then you can do this. Um, when you're doing this, you have a callback, and the callback is, um, it's not on success or on failure. The callback has just one method. And this one method says, if we got disconnected, this callback calls you, right? So what we did uh, is we have the callback implemented here. And because in Kotlin, you can have the implementation of a single uh, listener method by the code block. 
So this is the code block which basically reinitializes the uh, the Wi-Fi subsystem. So this call initializes the, the Wi-Fi subsystem and connects you to it. And when you get disconnected, this listener kicks in, which goes back here and it reinitializes it. And then we don't have a listener, right? So if we got kicked out second time currently in the current implementation, we kind of stuck. That, that's it, right? Um, you basically need to re-implement it to make it more robust. But you obtain the, the manager and then you initialize the Wi-Fi subsystem and you deal with these connections somehow. Okay, so once you've done that, you can do peer discovery, right? So you can initiate um, a call to, to discover all the peers which are currently in the network. And to do that, um, you call, um, so you call, Um, let me see this one. Yeah, register listener. So we doing the yes. So um, there are three classes. So there is a main activity class, which is the main activity. There is the peer manager, which manages all our peers, and we're doing the initialization of the Wi-Fi subsystem here. And there is a broadcast receiver which is the one responsible for handling the intents. Uh, that's what I, I to told initially, that you have some things which happen through intents and some things which happen through uh, callbacks. All the things which happen in the callbacks, we deal inside the peer manager. All the things which happen through the intents, we deal in the net broadcast receiver. And then in the main activity, in the, uh, on post, we unregister the listener and then on resume, we register the listener, right? So when we create the listener, uh, the listener uh, initiates the peer manager, the um, Wi-Fi subsystem, and as a side effect of initialization, it calls discover peers, right? So first, it init initializes the new peer manager, and all this initialization which I talked about happens in here, and then it issues the discovering the peers. When you issue this command, you have the action listener which has on success and on failure. But it is not called when this comes back. It, it basically calls, goes back almost immediately when the process of discovery starts, right? Um, so when you discover peers, you basically tell the operating system like, oh, listen, I'm interested in you starting the discovery. Uh, and then when things happen, notify me through intents. And when this call happen is happening, the subsystem says, yes, I will do it. And then you get on success, which gives you nothing yet. And, or it says, I'm already doing a dis discovery and then you will get failure. Or it may say, okay, there is an error. For example, you don't have the location uh, permission. It will just gives you an error zero saying, okay, you don't have a, which effectively means you don't have uh, location access. Um, so it only reports whether this call was successful or not, but it doesn't give you any peers yet. You don't get any response here. You just initiate it. Um, and as I said, if you call this twice in a row, the second time round, it will be on failure because I'm busy. You will get kind of a busy uh, error code, which means uh, the system is already doing the discovery. It's the same if you go on your phone and you go to Wi-Fi Direct and you press search for peers yourself as a user. Then the discovery will be happening. And then if the app starts and calls this method, it will also come back with on failure because the system is already busy, right? So this on success and on failure has kind of a little bit muddled semantics. Uh, but it is useful to know what state your Wi-Fi subsystem is in. And then, once the operating system finishes, 
then you have this. You have those intents which have to do with the various state of your application and various um, state of the peers. So for example, if you get this intent back, it means that the peer discovery finished and it has a list of peers. It doesn't mean the list changed actually. It means it just means that it finished and it gives you the list of peers. It might be the same as the previous call you've done, right? So if you do it once and let's say you get two peers, you call it second time, you will still get uh, this back with the same two peers, right? The, so the peers changed is also a little bit misleading uh, because they are not necessarily changed. It's just that you get back this kind of call. Uh, and then you can kind of um, request the actual peers uh, from, the, from the subsystem. And this call again is asynchronous, but the information for this one comes back through the listener. So this, the information for getting the info about the peers which are nearby is asynchronous but it's through the callback not through the intents um, so this is th this callback we defined in the peer-to-peer -peer subsystem so it's kind of here um, so when um, you get the the peers back this is the callback of the peer list and we kind of managing the logic of what to do with the new list of peers um, so the, then you have this um, management of the, of the peers. There is one um, extra callback that we, we need to deal with, which is the uh, connection. Um, if, um, if something happens with the, with the connection, you get this kind of intent, and then you can manage um, the, the handling of the connectivity between the peers. So, First, you are one peer, then other peers appear, then you know about their existence, then you call, okay, give me the list. So then you get the detailed list of the, um, of the uh, existence, and then you connect to them. And then this one gives you back if the connection kind of got established or not. And once the connection goes established, that means they will get assigned an IP address, and then I can actually connect over layer four. Um, so it kind of goes in stages and there are a couple of stages you have to go through and as, I, as I'm saying it's a little bit complicated because it goes between the callbacks and between the intents and you have to sort of work it out what those different things mean. They are a little bit confusing so even though the guide looks very simple um, they kind of re written it in such a way that it's a bit disconnected and you have to make all those connections kind of in your head uh, so uh, to simplify, if anyone wants to play with this, uh, we have the code which basically works, uh, which goes through all those stages, discovers the peers, connects them, and prints to the log uh, the information that you know the peers are discovered and the peers are connected, and then you basically have the IP address of the peer you've just connected to, such that you can either connect to the peer or you can connect to the uh, group manager via the sockets. Um, so this this is kind of uh, handled. It, it took uh, it took us yeah I don't know three days of fighting and banging the head around because there there are some very meaningless error messages sometimes, uh, but effectively it works. Uh, one gotcha which we also got is that unfortunately the emulator doesn't work. So the emulator will not help you testing any of this because the Wi-Fi subsystem on the emulator is basically emulated. Um, so it just pretends that you have sort of a network, uh, but not really the Wi-Fi subsystem. So you cannot use Wi-Fi direct in the emulator. Um, you have to have physical phones for, for testing purposes. Um, and we, we've been playing with this for the master course with the mobile uh, research guys to implement some clever routing mechanisms on top of Wi-Fi Direct to pass messages across multiple groups or multiple isolated islands of the Wi-Fi Connect, um, Wi-Fi Direct con connectivity. So that's why the, the package name is from the, um, from the master course. And this kind of uh, initial implementation was done with uh, some of the master students in the, in the other course. Um, 
Yes, so this is kind of a very quick, very high level overview of the various um, stages you have to go through to get the uh, Wi-Fi direct connectivity going. Uh, but this one is the most uh, verbose, like you are in full control of who is part of your mesh network and who gets connected to whom and how, you know, how does that actually happen with which frequency uh, and so on. Um, another interesting thing is that you have this, um, you have this, um, yeah, this one. Uh, so when you initially connect to the Wi-Fi subsystem, you don't get anything un unless the user changes it off. And then if it changes it off, you will get this one. Um, then when you issue that discover peers, you're gonna get this response, but just once, right? So every time you issue this, you're gonna get one of these, and then nothing happens. And then when you issue a connect, so once you connect to the other peer, then this will happen, but this will not happen just once. It will continue to happen approximately twice a second. Um, so if you if you are connected to one of the other peers, both of them will see that they are connected. And this is sort of like a heartbeat message, which happens approximately twice a second. Uh, so it constantly happens, right? Um, so this may or may not be annoying, depends how you deal with this, but you basically can kind of use it as a heartbeat such that the other peer is still alive and you know you can use it for whatever gaming or whatever situation you, you're using this Wi-Fi peer-to-peer -peer connectivity. Um, so th that was also not well documented. And like, I don't know if this behavior is specific to my Pixel phones or if this behavior is kind of typical to a a any device. Um, but this heartbeat messaging is happening here. And then if you disconnect, th this stops. So you get once that it, it is kind of disconnected and then it, it, it stops. Also interesting is the interplay between the apps and the user. So the user can also play with Wi-Fi Direct. Um, so even if the user doesn't have your app, the user can connect his phone to your phone and get an IP address from your app uh, playing with the Wi-Fi Direct, right? Um, so you don't really need to have client server. You can just have the phone, vanilla phone, and still connect to your app using manual connection. When you're using the manual one, um, you will get a pop-up saying, oh yeah, this device wants to connect to you over a Wi-Fi Direct, do you agree? And then you can say yes or no. Uh, if the two apps are connecting behind the scene, like you don't interact with the phone, then the connection happens without the user uh, interacting with the phone at all. So you don't need to agree to it or approve it, it will just happen. So the two apps will connect with each other without the user knowing. Uh, which may or may not be a feature, like depending again what you want. Like if it is a messaging app, you want no, no user interaction because it would be super annoying if you're walking in a shopping mall and you're constantly being asked, oh, do you want to connect to this phone or to this phone or whatever, right? It would not work. Um, so you want th this to be seamless. Uh, but sometimes for some use cases, maybe you don't want it to be seamless. Um, if you don't want it to be seamless, there is a mechanism in the API which defines how you're connecting. Um, so let me show you the connect method. And there is this uh, WPS uh, setup. And if you use this um, PBC flag, that makes it non-interactive with the user. But there is another way which, for example, requires a pin code or some other interaction from the user and then the user will be notified and or maybe requested to enter a particular uh, pin to allow the connectivity, right? Um, I believe the Wi-Fi Direct doesn't check the, um, doesn't check who is the owner of the app, like the nearby API. So I think multiple implementations, as long as they follow the Wi-Fi Direct can kind of participate in your app and then as long as they follow the socket communication, they, they can be re-implemented you know, um, arbitrarily. Uh, so that differs from nearby API, which enforces that only a single app can kind of do this messaging. Um, 
All right, so that that's all from me. Um, it was a, a rather intense uh, go through the Wi-Fi Direct. Um, let me go back to the slides. So I have some homework for you to try. Um, so if you try to implement a simple client service server chat, so you open a socket and you pass strings and on the other end you read strings and you pass strings back. Uh, so that's what we did with Netcat. You, then you can test it with Netcat yourself and you can kind of reuse it into different uh, applications that you might have. Uh, for example, one using NSD or one using a peer-to-peer -peer Wi-Fi Direct. So once you have this, this one, then it's kind of easy to play with it, test it, and then implement something with the other two. So this one is already implemented, but it is missing the socket um, messaging. So if you play with this and add it to, the, to, to this implementation, then you basically have a dis, 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 distributed decentralized uh, chat app. Um, and yeah, that's it. So of course you don't need to do the homework. It's just for those of you who wants to play with the ad hoc networking. Um, otherwise, um, have a look at the code. Um, I tried to follow the, um, the modern Android X uh, patterns with uh, navigation and data binding and view bindings. Um, the UI is there, but it's not like super fancy yet, and it's not hooked up with the peer discovery yet. So the peer discovery subsystem is a little bit detached from the UI. Uh, now nothing happens in the UI uh, at, at, at the moment. Uh, but that was not the point. The point was to get the networking going. Um, all right, so that's all. Um, any questions? Any ideas? Any ideas for tomorrow? Do you want the Q&A session tomorrow? Yeah, Jon, some ideas? Go ahead. Okay, so let's uh, let's keep the session tomorrow as a Q and A. Um, there is a lot of potential usage for Wi-Fi and for uh, local area uh, communication. So you can exchange uh, information between the apps. Uh, if you if two users have the same app, you can exchange certain things uh, very easily. Uh, you can have a chat built in. You can have some discovery. You can have some sort of handshake. You can use it for games like local area games. Um, so there is a lot of potential uh, and you can make life really easy for the user because then things can happen kind of seamlessly. Um, it, it is a little bit of work, but from the user point of view, not needing an access point is a huge kind of advantage. Uh, you can have a chat uh, with your flatmates without going over to network at all, right? Um, so that that is <laughs> quite good. Um, I don't know, like it's it's your imagination which is the limit, really. Um, I'm really keen, like on this ultrasonic. Um, uh, where is this uh, net uh, nearby API? Yes, I I am kind of interested in trying out how this near ultrasonic audio uh, works. Will it really work if I uh, put the phone into flight mode? Uh, can I send messages between two phones in the flight mode? Uh, because that would be so cool when you're chatting in the plane and they tell you to put the phone into flight mode and you're still chatting with somebody else, right? Um, yeah. Anyway. Um, so I will stop the recording.